Hey, you guys! Thanks for joining me on another journey. Today we got a different episode. We're here at a whiskey tour. So if you don't like whiskey, turn the video off now. But it's gonna be fun. We're at Stranahan's Whiskey in Colorado. And this is Cole, buddy of mine. How's it going? My evil instigator, <laughs> drinking whiskey. It's a Dodge. Dodge Brothers. This is actually John Wayne's old truck. How many of you guys have had Stranahan's before? Okay, cool. Uh, we got a lot of new friends. What's that? Yeah. Just now? That counts, yeah, for the first time. We're gonna learn a ton today, guys. I wanna start off talking a little bit about our story, though, a little bit of how we got here. And our story begins with this gentleman up here. So that's our founder. His name is Jess Graver. Jess comes from a little town just outside of Aspen. It's called Woody Creek, Colorado. Uh, if you've heard of Woody Creek, it's probably because that's where Hunter S. Thompson lived for most of his life. Hunter S. Thompson was actually friends with Jess. He had a knack for showing up in Jess's bar whenever he'd fire up his still, which if you know anything about Hunter S. Thompson makes perfect sense. But anyway, so Jess did a lot of things, obviously made whiskey, he worked construction, uh, he had a ranch, he was a bit of a cowboy. He was also a volunteer firefighter. And weirdly, that's kind of how our story begins. So one night in the late 90s, Jess got called down to a fire on Flying Dog Ranch. Have you guys ever heard of the brewery called Flying Dog? Yeah, so Flying Dog is a brewery, it's still around. It used to be located in downtown Denver, up by the ballpark, and it was owned by a man named George Stranahan, who also owned Flying Dog Ranch. So it was George's barn that was going up in flames out there. So Jess rushed out there, he was unable to save the barn, but he did meet George. He got very excited when he found out George was a brewer, he was kind of immediately like, hey man, I'm trying to start this whiskey project, it'd be really cool if you could help me out. George is like, dude, it's three in the morning, my barn just burned down, don't really care about your business plan right now. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, they became friends, they had a lot in common, and eventually George agreed to help Jess start his project. So what they did was in 2004, they moved Jess next door to Flying Dog, they cut a hole through the wall, and those brewers would brew his wash, pump it through the wall, and he would distill on the other side which actually worked out pretty well for a couple of years until George wound up moving his operation out to the East Coast. So if you're ever out in Frederick, Maryland, go check out Flying Dog. They make great beer. I'm just personally a fan. They have a big, beautiful brewery out there. That's super cool. However, at the time, it left Jess in a bit of a bind because he no longer had the brewers or their equipment working for him anymore, and the building he was in was just completely falling apart. So. That's where this building comes into the story. Uh, when I was a kid, this was a beef jerky factory. That's pretty much how I remember it. Uh, it was a winery for a little while, and then it was actually a brewery called Heavenly Days. Has anyone ever heard of Heavenly Days Brewery? Probably not. Yeah, they were around. They're kind of part of that big craft beer boom here in Denver in the 90s. I actually had a couple guys come on my tour once that went on the Heavenly Days tour way back in the day. I used tour loosely because they told me they were just handed a pitcher so they could walk around and drink whatever they wanted and they didn't have to leave until they felt like they were done. Um, <laughs> which, granted, is a way cooler tour than what I'm about to give you, but uh, didn't exactly work out for those guys in the end. Unfortunately, they went out of business, but we got this building in 2009. We also got Heavenly Days' old mash tun, oil kettle, and these first three smaller fermenters right here. So it worked out really well for us. We love it here, guys. We now own the whole city block actually so that's pretty cool all right i want to address something so people tend to think we make bourbon here i hear it like every day people walk in they're like oh I love you guys it's bourbon you guys make great bourbon we do not make bourbon here we make what's called american single malt and what that means is while we do have some things in common with bourbon we take something very important away from scotch as well so what do you guys know about scotch what makes scotch scotch there it is. Scotland, yeah, don't overthink it, I always say. <laughs> so scotch is made in Scotland. There's something else, though. It's actually the grain. What's that? Peat water or process. Peat water or process. So peat is common. Uh, the water is, they're very covetous of their unique water sources. But actually what I'm getting at is the grain. 
Uh, so whenever we're talking about types of whiskey, guys, we're gonna come back to two things over and over again. Where it's distilled, what type of grain you're using. So while we're not in Scotland, just like Scotch, Scottish distillers though, we do use malted barley. Uh, traditionally, let's move into our grist mill, which you can't really see, it's behind this wall. There's really not much to look at though. The grist mill just has a couple rollers. We're gonna crack open that barley. We're not trying to grind it up into flour, we're just trying to get that starch out of there. So from there, it's gonna move through the state-of-the-art high-tech PVC pipe. It's gonna come down here and drop into the mash tun. So the mash tun, it's basically just a big coffee pot with a false bottom. We're gonna add hot water, steep up all of that barley. It's going to convert all of those starches into sugars. The end result is it's basically just like a sweet barley tea. It's what we call distiller's wort. So that's good. We're gonna drain that wort off. It's gonna move on to the boil kettle. Now, if we were brewing beer, this is where we would be adding hops. But obviously we're not going to do that. We're just gonna boil it up. It's gonna kill off any bacteria, anything living in there. Next is the whirlpool. The whirlpool is just a large centrifuge. We're gonna spin it around. Anything solid will fall down. We can remove that as well. So this is where fermentation comes in, guys. So we'll take our wort, put it in one of these large fermenters. We're going to add our own proprietary strain of yeast, which is actually what this strange little tank right here is. And yeast is a living organism, so it has to eat and it has to create waste. So it's gonna to love to eat up all that sugar and it will give us two byproducts, which are Alcohol, yeah, and CO2 is the other. So alcohol, that's good. That's like why we're here and doing this, right? So that's cool. Uh, CO2, we don't need. We're not making fizzy whiskey. That sounds weird. So we're just gonna pipe this. That's cool, guys. Yeah, cool. <laughs> All right, so welcome to our stills, guys. They're, they're beautiful, aren't they? They are. And we're very proud of these stills because they're kind of unique. They're kind of different. They're what we call hybrid stills. So a hybrid still is a combination of a pot still and a cola still. The pot still down here, that's what you're gonna see in Scotland and Ireland to make Scotch and Irish whiskey. Uh, it allows more water to move through the still. We talked about how Scottish distillers are very proud of their unique water sources, they lend unique flavors. The pot still helps bring out those flavors <clears throat> because of that large shape. However, the pot still, it's very traditional, kind of antiquated style of still, so it's actually pretty inefficient. So that's why we put a column up on top there. So you'll see column stills at bourbon distilleries. They have the really tall, like 35 foot high ones. But generally speaking, traditionally speaking, they're used for things like vodka, gin, spirits with higher purity, less flavor, because they're highly efficient. So we decided to get the best of both worlds, hook them up together. Uh, these were custom made for us out in Kentucky. There's a famous copper works out there. It's called Vendome. They custom made these for us. At the time, hybrid stills were really not a thing in North America. We actually had to persuade Vendome to make them for us because it was like this small, weird custom order. There's currently a five-year waiting list at Vendome to get a hybrid still. You see them all over the place, but we are amongst the first in this part of the world to use them, so we're very proud of them. How it works is we'll take our watch, put it in the still, of course. We're gonna heat it from the bottom with steam. And essentially all that we're doing, guys, is boiling off the alcohol and collecting it. So the boiling point of alcohol is approximately 30 degrees lower than that of water. So we keep around that point, around 174 degrees. That alcohol is gonna separate from that water. It's gonna rise up in a vapor through that column. So in the column itself, you have a series of false bottoms. They're called bubble plates. Every time it touches one of those plates, it will condense and then re-evaporate. So every time it's moving through a plate, it's shedding more water and impurities. It's percolating in that chamber. It's becoming more saturated with alcohol. So it's gonna go all the way up. Uh, that horizontal bar on top, that's just a condenser. It'll touch that, cool it down, drop it back down into a liquid. So this first distillation, it's what we call a stripping run. We're trying to get the proof way up there, of course. We're also trying to purify the spirit as much as possible. And copper is ideal for that. Obviously it conducts heat well, but it won't affect the flavor. It will also draw sulfur-based compounds to the metal itself. So when you clean these guys out, there's like this gross, smelly film in there. That's good. Those are sulfides. We don't want sulfides in our whiskey. We want to leave them behind in our stripping stills. So we do this one time. The wash is only going to go through one of these stills one time. And then we have what we call the low wines. Now the low wines are about 80 proof, about 40% alcohol, which is okay. We're in 94 proof whiskey. We've got to keep climbing. So we come on down to our spirit stills. Because they weren't very good at cutting their heads. They were putting them in their final product. And this is problematic because heads are not ethanol, they are methanol, which is toxic to the human body. 
Uh, methanol basically converts to formaldehyde in your system, which we embalm corpses with, of course, and it will attack your optic nerve as well, which is why people were going blind after drinking bathtub gin during Prohibition. So, oh. uh, yeah, we're gonna cut those heads. We are not going to use them. We do keep a big bucket of them, though, in our mop closet, because we clean things with them. Uh, they're great at killing stuff, it turns out. Other than that, uh, one of my favorite little anecdotes, one of our distillers actually retrofitted a motorcycle to run on heads once, which was super rad. Unfortunately, it got stolen, but he found it at a gas station like three days later. So, <laughs> moral of the story, you don't want to put that in your body. We're going to cut those heads. We're not going to use them. <laughs> now, what falls to the bottom of the still? These are the heavy and pure alcohols. They're larger alcoholic molecules, hence why they fall to the bottom. They're what we call the tails. Um, so I like to illustrate it this way, guys. So a little bit about me. I'm a musician, and that means two things. I like to party, and I never have any money. So what I do sometimes <laughs> is I go to my local liquor store, I go to that very bottom shelf, pick up that big plastic bottle of booze, have a little night on the town on the cheap. But it seems like when I do that, <laughs> my hangover the next day is significantly worse, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't pretend yep. like you guys don't know what I'm talking about. So, there's a reason for that. A lot of other distilleries, because they produce so many tails, will redistill them one or two more times, put them in that plastic bottle, sell them on the bottom shelf on their off-brand label. They're not poisonous like heads are, but because they're those larger alcoholic molecules, our bodies can't process them. They're gonna linger in your system for twice as long. Your body's working much harder to flush them out. So that is why when you drink that low quality booze, you're gonna have that lingering hangover the next day that never quite seems to go away. So, uh, so we're gonna cut our tails as well. It's not really our thing around here. We're trying to make a high quality product. Full disclosure though, guys, you can still get a hangover from drinking Stranahan's. I can personally reaffirm this fact as recently as today. Uh, but what we're going to be using, well, somewhere between our heads and our tails, and they're what we call the hearts. Also known as White Dog, Moonshine, White Lightning, Hooch, the High Wines, whatever you want to call it, this is the good stuff. This is the most pure form of ethanol coming off the still. This is what we're putting in our barrels for aging. 